Hi, everybody. You're listening to the Oneness Junkie podcast, hosted by me, Lydia Smith, a self-proclaimed Oneness Junkie. Oneness Junkie is a place to be inspired, encouraged, and supported. Learn from the individuals who are working to make the world a better place. Let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone. It's Lydia with the Oneness Junkie podcast and YouTube channel. And today I'm here sitting with Maria Cruz, author of Soul on Fire. Hi, Maria. Hi, Lydia. Thank you for hosting me today. I appreciate that. Yes, I'm so excited about what we have planned for our audience today. And I want to take a moment to just let everyone know that there might be some triggers inside of this podcast. So if you are sensitive to conversations around abuse, we want you to first know that the purpose of this episode is to help bring healing. And I'm going to have Maria talk in a second, a little bit about that. But we also want to know, want you to know that if that could cause a problem for you. Um, maybe this isn't the time to listen to Maria's story because we're going to go into some conversations that might be triggering, but that's our intention is to help people not feel alone and to feel like there is a pathway out of pain. So with just a little bit of um, conversation, Maria, will you share your your one liner about what your intention is about telling your story and when you wrote your book what your intention was sure um when i first started i i really wanted to think about leaving a legacy for this world and i wanted to make sure that people know that a lot of us walk around in this world and I call them walking wounded. And my goal by writing this book is to provide people with hope and, and healing for their hurting hearts. Because unfortunately, like I said, a lot of us are walking wounded in the world. And my goal is just to help shed light uh, on the subject of shame, on the subject of, you know, child abuse, sexual abuse, uh, neglect, you name it. And and it's also about releasing the shame off of the individual because the shame never belonged to us. It belonged on the perpetrators. And that was something I had to learn myself as well. And that's my goal. Yeah. Well, thank you. So providing some healing for hurting hearts is a great intention for telling anyone, telling anyone's story. And I I have a feeling that's the most common reason that most people tell their stories is to try to help with heal the world. So will you take a moment and just do a general introduction about who you are today and where you are at this moment? I have to say, I consider myself a warrior. Um, I will fight for any child that needs help, whether it's in the school system or whether it's a home situation. I was I spent 11 years as an advocate for teenagers, mainly teenagers, and they were residents of a government-run facility. They were removed from their homes for various reasons. And I basically, and this was a volunteer spot, by the way, for 11 years, I volunteered to be on that campus and to help mentor kids and advocate for them when I didn't feel that they were being treated properly in the school system. Yeah. And you're, um, you're a mom, are you a mom today and a wife? And I am, I, I have a son named Mark and I have two other children that were chosen and put on my destiny to be a part of my life and my husband's and, I was also uh, an educator. I had to learn how to teach my two youngest. Uh, They had special needs. So I was not aware of how to be able to reach them. So I had to learn, you know, specific tools in order to get them to where they need to be. Like, for example, my son uh, later on was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. 
and he also had anxiety issues. My daughter, on the other hand, um, she had uh, later on diagnosed something called reactive attachment disorder, which is actually, if anybody knows a little bit about mental health, it's a step above conduct disorder, which they used to just go to conduct disorder. But a lot of children that are adopted, unfortunately, experience trauma you know, prior to them coming to their, you know, adoptive parents. And my two did not have the proper care that they needed and and, and they suffered. But, you know, their dad and I, we really worked extremely hard to get them to where they are today. That's so. great. Wonderful. So I want the audience, there's a, there's an audible audience and then there's a video audience. But for those who are watching on video, you're about to see a beautiful book cover. Why don't you show them all your book cover and um, share with them how, what you came, how you came up with that, what you were sharing with me earlier. Okay. So if all of you can see, I'm trying to get that in line right there. This is called soul on fire. And it has to do with my transcendence to finding and discovering who I truly was. Uh, a lot of times we go through life contorting who we are just to meet somebody's approval or their perception of who they think we should be. And it's not that way. And when we're standing around saying, hey, you know, please validate me because I want you to approve of me and show me that I have value to you. And what I realized in this book is that we as individuals don't have to prove anything to anybody. We are whole, we are 100% energy, we are love, and we do not have to take our identity from someone else and adopt that as our own. It's, it's not true. So what I did in this particular design of my book is the lady, as you can see, um, partially she's ashes and there's some disintegration there. And from the black, which is the burning, which is basically the destruction of my childhood. And then as she becomes older and becomes an adult, she takes full form. And the light that you see in the book here at the very top is, in my opinion, I, I wrote this to be the light of God. So those radiant beings that are coming down and the girl is giving nothing but praise and glory to God. For delivering oh. her out of, you know, bondage. I mean, out of, out of hell. So that energy and that light around her is the light that God gave to me so that I could help others find their way. And that's the story behind the cover of the book. That's beautiful. How did you come up with the title, Soul on Fire? I have been very, very spunky. Um, I had to fight for, you know, my, my life. I had to fight for food. I had to fight for a job. I had to fight most of my life. And I just developed this innate, I don't know what it was, but self-worth, let's say. And I just remember saying like, I'll be damned. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll be damned if they say that I can't have this promotion or I can't make that kind of money or they're going to talk to me like I'm some like, uh, I don't know, like little sex symbol thing. I mean, when I was younger, I was, I guess, very shapely and I was unfortunately um, in the workplace. There was a lot of, I forgot what you call that. Um, like misogyny. Oh, it was horrible. I mean, I had merry men constantly hitting on me and making rude comments and things like that. And, you know, I had to take it. I mean, it was definitely a horrible time for me, but I had to fight. I had yeah, to fight. That's, that's before the Me Too movement when all that was getting brought out to, exactly. to light, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, did, so did you, so you came up with the soul on fire how, because, you, because you were spunky? Is that what you were saying? <laughs> I just had a very strong tenacity to fight, meaning that I would set my eyes on a goal and I would march to it. I may not have had a direct plan, but I knew that I wanted, for example, to work at Lockheed Martin when I was much, much younger. Well, I barely had my uh, GED. And I also didn't have really much experience behind anything, but I found out what uh, temporary service provided 
uh, clerical support for Lockheed Martin. And I went straight to them and I said, you know, I took their little typing test. I taught myself how to type. And I said to them, wow. I take assignments. I will only take assignments if you send me to Lockheed. Other than that, don't call me. And they called me one day and it was an assignment at Lockheed. And then when I got there, it was really hard to get in because again, you know, I have a GED, whoopie do, and I learned how to type. But in order to get to the next level, somebody had to promote you. So you become what they call, you know, one of their employees versus a contractor. And I did that. It took me eight months, but by golly, I left no stone unturned. And I must have talked to I don't know, 800 people saying, hey, how do I do this? Hey, how do I do that? Because that's where I, I knew I wanted to work. It was a large company, gave ample opportunity, fabulous benefits. I didn't even know what a freaking dentist was. So things like that. And I just was like, no, nope, I'm not taking no for an answer. You will, <laughs> you will hire me. That kind of thing. Yeah. So I thought. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. Okay. So let's get into some about the book. So um, do you want to tell your story as it is comfortable for whatever level it's comfortable to share? I'm just going to let you share with the audience your background and what you endured and went through in order to get to the point where we'll talk about the now and then the future for you. Okay. Sure. Uh, my mother uh, from uh, in the book, I discuss it as well, but my, my mother was uh, an arranged marriage at 13. She was, uh, I guess, proposed to overseas and long story short. At 14, Where was she from? Where was she from? My mother was from Sicily. OK, so and, Italy. OK. Yeah. yeah. And my uh, father's lineage was from Spain and then they had later moved to uh, Sicily as well. And the arrangement of the marriage, he came over, he married her at 14. I had a brother, uh, my mother had had at 16 years old. His name was Diego. And unfortunately he passed away, uh, 24 days old and he died of pneumonia. And here my mother, it's, it's really perplexed because here she was a mother and she had a say over this little infant child but yet she wasn't old enough to drive a car and there were no cell phones at the time. So she couldn't even, you know, dial somebody out. I mean, yes, they had a landline, but she couldn't reach the doctor. She couldn't reach my birth father and my brother wound up dying in her arms. So that really took a toll on her. And that was when she was 16. I didn't come along until my mom was 19. And in between there, she had a couple miscarriages, then my brother, and then, and then me. So um, she had a hard life. And I didn't really give her full credit for that because my life, she thought I had to mirror hers. So at 11 and 12, you know, I was hearing things like, you know, we got to find you a husband and find you a suitor. And, you know, that's was my normal. I mean, children grow up in a chaotic environment. That's normal for them. You know, children grow up with a loving, doting mom and dad, see something like that and are like, wow, that's really messed up or that's crazy. But in my situation, that's what I saw growing up. So I naturally assumed I follow in that same footsteps. So that's a little background on my mother, my father and my mother. She separated from him when I was maybe two, because I remember him not being around much after, I want to say a year, 18 months. I don't, I don't remember him being in the picture that much at all after that. And uh, later on, she did divorce him though. And then he disappeared and I never heard from my birth father. And that's why I call him my birth father because he was never there. And he doesn't have a name in my book either. Uh, let me ask you something. Was this, in, was your mom in America or in Sicily at the time of all no, of the no, she, babies? She was, she was here. Oh, okay. She was okay. born there and, and they came over when my mother was about five. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she kind of grew up here. Got it. Yes. My father but did she not. had like old beliefs. world, she had old world beliefs though. Uh, like oh, yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, I mean, was she was she educated at all or just high school or not even high school? What was her education? No. Eighth grade. Okay. Oh, and then she gets married off. She gets married and off. 
and they well, and, and the, the same time, with your grandparents. Stuff. Would they? I mean, I'm just want, looking at this lineage of like them. Yeah. Were they? Were they? They came over here as immigrants and had to make yes. a hard yeah. life, right? My my grandparents used to work in the fields and okay. uh, picking olives or you know wheat or whatever. And my grandfather, from what I was told, had a fifth grade education, and my grandmother a third grade education. Right. So they were uh, ignorant and illiterate, honestly. Well, not, not only that, but mar- just to put it into context, I mean, marriage at a young age was survival. That's what survival was. You had to find a way to survive with another partner. And I think that's where that gets m- matched up so early on, you know, because like if you don't have education, it's hard to get a job, you know, so at least... I mean, I think that's where it comes from. But um, anyway, so you got kind of lined up with, she wanted you to find someone is kind of where we're at. Actually, she pretty much found them for me. Oh, she did. How old were you? I was 14. Okay. And she was married at 14. So anyway, you know, the fruit didn't fall far from the tree. How about that? Because her mentality was still stuck where, my grandparents, you know, had her, I guess, right. and she never thought for herself. It wasn't like you speak against them because from my understanding, and I definitely see the pattern of the intergenerational trauma and dysfunction that came along because, you know, my grandparents used to beat the living daylights out of their children. And so as, you know, I grew up, I was beaten. My aunt beat her kids. My uncle sometimes beat his, you know, so it was, you know, I guess standard, you know, you're not behaving or you really want to enforce, you know, getting chores done or something. I mean, you beat the living crap out of your kids. Right. You you submission through fear, right? Correct. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and at this point, you know, what would you like to tell us about what you experienced, um, at around this age, like when you were being kind of matched up with someone? I mean, I wasn't like on board with it, but I was also a very meek child. I rarely spoke out because, you know, I could get beaten at the drop of a hat. So yeah, I, you were beaten into submission. Yeah, I, I I lived in a state of fear most of my childhood that I can remember. Everything that I can remember, I don't really remember really many good times. Yeah, but you know, it is what it is. So, was it you that was telling me that when you went to school, it was like safety? It was like. A respite yeah. during the day that that's yeah, where was. you found an outlet for freedom I loved school I loved especially like in elementary I remember um I gravitated to the teachers because I had all the female teachers and it was just a wonderful feeling to know that I could go up to them and get this really great hug and not be pushed away or sometimes hurt you know that that kind of thing so it, it was a wonderful wonderful feeling to to have that type of uh resiliency i guess was available to me through my teachers and they had probably no idea what they were providing for me but it was it was mind mind changing for me you know i would go home and i would feel good and my little happy cup would be filled because i had someone actually give me genuine affection versus ignore me or have nothing to do with me or, or harm me because, you know, I wanted a hug or something or say something really not nice to me. Yeah. How old were you when your mom remarried? I was six. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and you had a brother. Yes. My yeah. brother. Yeah. I love my brother very much. He's actually the oldest between he and I, but I mean, I, I, I guard him with my life. You know, I remember because he used to get beat too. And I hated, absolutely hated the crying because there was nothing I could do to help him. So I felt so helpless and it would just rip my insides out Yeah, because there's nothing I could do. All I could do was cry when I heard him cry. Yeah. 
so, so sad. I'm so sorry sad. that you had to go through that. So, mm -hmm. um, what other aspects do you want to share about your childhood and your story to help the audience connect with what you've been through? Um, I will tell you, I had a childhood just full of uncertainty and also fear because I was never really safe. I went to bed at night and sometimes my stepfather would show up in my room and touching me in places he should never have touched a little girl. And uh, same thing with the beatings. I mean, out of the blue, I would get a beating for what I don't know. Um, to this day, I remember one where I was just beaten with a spatula, I remember, and a belt and just whatever they could find, I guess, sometimes to hit me. And I was black and blue. And I wasn't allowed to wear shorts to school, but it was in the middle it was in the middle of August. I'll never forget it because school had just started and it was so, so hot. And at the time, the schools really didn't have air conditionings in the classroom. So it was hot, but I was made to wear slacks to school. And I happened to catch a glimpse because, you know, I, I didn't have a full, full mirror like, to yeah, anything. Mirror. Right. But I happened to catch... I don't know, a glimpse of, I don't know, my hiney or something. And I saw just purple, black, blue, you name it. I had like all the colors all up and down my legs, my back, my bottom, and even up on the top of my arms. So, you know, I had to wear shirts with sleeves and I had to wear slacks for, I'd say at least six weeks. It was, was really. Your, was it your mom that was hitting you or was it your stepdad who was beating you? Um, she would join in. Sometimes, um, not always. She was usually the one with the hands, but uh, there was a time that my stepfather went after my brother and I think I was about eight or nine and I was like, that's it. I've had enough. And I heard him crying in the other bedroom and I went out of the be my bedroom into the hallway and his was right next to mine. And as I got to his door, my mother came out. And I was shocked thinking, oh my God, she's, she's going to be there to, you know, stop what's happening. And she didn't. And I kept hearing the wax hitting my brother and she pushed me back and said, go back to your room. And I didn't want to go back to my room. So, you know, she started to hit me before you know it. You know, I was big enough at that point because my mom was little like me. I was able to, you know, push back because I was proceeding to get into that room and I was going to try to grab that belt and do whatever I could to help my brother she um found I remember a handle it was a long so maybe a broom uh, and I remember her starting to hit me with it and she was hitting my hands and it was really really stinging and I kept trying to block her and I kept backing up back down the hallway because those wax were really hard and so uh, she's got a little firmer and harder with those. And I remember um, she hit me in the back of the head. She hit me in my back. And I remember covering my head because. It was painful. I mean, it, was, it was more than painful. I was afraid she was going to split my head open is what I was really afraid of. And I remember, okay, you only have one brain. You got plenty of whatever vertebrae, but you only have one brain. <laughs> so I remember covering my head and I heard up and scurried into my room and I put my body behind the door and pushed my legs up against my dresser that was like right near the door so that I could put all my weight into the door so she could not enter that room and continue to wail on me so yeah so one yeah but the psychological abuse I would say was probably worse than the beatings like I could talk about the beatings all day long they don't face me at all but some of the words she said to me and some of the game she played with me mentally really was disturbing for me. Um, because, you know, you'd put something down, you'd go back and get it, it'd be gone. And you're like, where did I leave that? And go to find out, you know, you'd ask her and she would say, I don't have that. But yet in reality, she did. Yeah, she so, did it. Lighting. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But she was gaslighting me. And then, I mean, it was just always tumultuous. And then she hated me. And I mean, it was all this, like, you know, if you do this, then, you know, you're in my graces for today. And if you, for whatever reason, you know, if the wind blew the other way, then you were on her shit list. But 
What did that mean? What did I do? And I remember saying that a lot as a kid. What did I do? What did I do? So that I wouldn't do it again. But there was never really an answer of what I did to deserve. Yeah, so unpredictable, me. right? Everything's so unpredictable. You can't figure it out. No, there was no way to figure any of that out. No. So how all. how long did you, well, she ended up getting you hooked up with someone, right? Didn't she end up marrying you off or something? Uh, she certainly tried. And that was the plan. And a few months, I want to say six months, maybe prior to um, this man, he was about to turn 18 and I was 14. Um, the parents would not give the consent and said when he turned 18, he could make that choice for himself. But honestly, it didn't matter to my mother. She went ahead and said that he could move into our home. And she told him um, he could stay in my room. Yeah. So he yeah. Ba she basically opens you up for business pretty much just to have children. She, You told me that she wanted to have a child, right? Yes. Yeah. But she no longer could have children because she had had a hysterectomy due to some medical conditions. And from my understanding of what I was told by the family is she wanted another child because she, supposedly she loved children. And I think, honestly, she wanted to replace the loss she had. It, you know, looking back on all of it and trying to piece it all together, that's what I think that was all about. Because when I did become pregnant, which was immediately, um, my son was born and I was 15. And a few months later, I turned 16, but um, I was no longer of service. So she had said that she had wanted me to move out. They and she was kicking you out. Oh, yeah, she was kicking me out for sure. And um, I had literally three. I'll never forget. It was like maybe 10 minutes to three. And she said, I want you out of here and I want you out by 6 p.m. But without the baby, right? You're supposed to leave the baby. She said she wanted me to leave him. And I told her no. Um, the cops were involved. And she really humiliated me uh, on the phone with the cops. And the cops said, hey, lady, sorry, but, you know, that's her child. She has every right to take that child with her. Right. And that I just think really infuriated her because she wanted to get rid of me but yet she wanted to keep my child and that, yeah. that so, wasn't going to happen. So sad. And, mm -hmm. and you were kicked out at the house and you did have to find a way to fend for yourself, which was very difficult. Yes. But when there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Going that... back was not an option for me ever again. She attacked me. She was in the middle of strangling me. Um, when I was trying to get out of the house and she just became totally enraged. And I guess because the cops had told her I had every right to take my child with me. And in the middle of her strangulating me, um, my son had fallen off the bed. And when he hit the floor, he let out a huge scream of which um, turned her attention and of course mine, you know, towards him, but I was blacking out. I was like literally just trying to fight to stay conscious. And when she turned, I was able to finally pry her hands off of my throat and finally, and then I pushed her with my weight and was able to grab him. And I ran out the door is uh, what I did. Yeah. That's so sad. I'm so sorry. You had to go through that. Mm. it's okay. And I'll tell you why. Um, honestly, I mean, my son was unscathed and that's he awesome. was safe, you know, he, he, he was safe. And that's all that mattered to me because out of everything in the whole wide world, that was horrible in my life. He was, he was my sunshine. And I mean, giving my life for him, I would never have thought of a nanosecond. That's a no brainer yeah. for me. So being able to keep him safe, even though, you know, she might've been hitting me, he was safe. He was safe in my arms and I had him covered and out the door, we darted out. 
And I called a lady that I babysat for, and she was kind enough to allow me to stay with her about six good weeks until I was able to literally, I mean, I got a full-time job. I worked at these two different little places. One was a Maryland fried chicken. I'll never forget it. <laughs> and the other one was the um, an ice cream parlor kind of thing. So between the two part-time jobs, I basically had a full-time job. And wow. I saved up everything I could and got an apartment. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I mean, such a, when you called yourself a warrior, you know, like life tends to show us who we really are, right? Yeah. You know, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. A lot of people, whatever, will say things like, oh, these are my friends, or oh, this is my family, or oh, whatever. Well, when the times are great, everyone's around. But when the times are really, really tough, you'll see who your real friends are and your family. I mean, it really came down to that because when I was homeless with Mark, I had absolutely nowhere to go. And my grandparents didn't want me. They're like, oh, go back home with your mother, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, not at all an option for me. No way. So I wouldn't go back and nor did they offer any refuge for me or my son. Um, my aunt, uh, she was raising her too. And those are my cousins, which I love and adore. But she wasn't able or willing, I think more willing, honestly, uh, than to allow me the opportunity to, to come and even just sleep on her floor. So yeah, I just, yeah, and I just tried whatever I could to keep going. Well, and let's tell the audience, you did go to like some religious support groups to help have like the charities and you had a negative experience with that as well. Right. So you did try all the little outlets. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was called Catholic social services. Um, they treated me horribly. Um, I had called them because prior to being kicked out of the home, my mother also had me leave the house earlier without all that violence. I mean, but, and then the police picked me up, took me to a place called the Beta Center, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And, and, and there I met this woman who was a nun, a Catholic nun. And she said, well, have you ever thought about, you know, giving your baby up for adoption? And I'm like, uh, hell no, no, not at all. <laughs> I like to raise my own baby. So she was also part of that Catholic social services. So when I reached out to them and she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a Friday. I'll never forget it. It was Friday. I lost my job that day and I had called her and she says, yes, yes, come down. We can help you. And I'm like, great. You know, and I went down there. I brought my son's diapers and formula and all this stuff. And I said, Hey, I really, really, really beg you please to, you know, give him uh, like a temporary facility, like, uh, guardianship or whatever you call it, foster care, whatever it's called. I said, you know, give him, because I didn't even know I was entitled to it because I was a minor still. They didn't even Yeah, you were what, like 16? Yeah, 16 and a half by then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, they didn't offer that. They And so this nun basically said in a nutshell, um, here's these documents. We can only help you if you sign them. And when I read them, they were basically relinquishing my rights as a parent so that he could be placed up for adoption. So I had that dropped on my lap and I had nowhere to go. I had no job. It was five thirty, six o'clock now. I mean, there was, there was nowhere for me to go. Cause after I left there, I had to sleep in my car. So nothing was offered to me, not even a sandwich, but they took my son. And I really, felt like my back was up against the wall. I begged and pleaded with them for at least two hours to reconsider, give them a home, you know, let me get on my feet, just give me six months. I, I can turn this around. Um, and they wouldn't do it. They said I had to sign those papers. And I remember leaving brokenhearted. My life was shattered at that moment. Yeah. 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 But I will tell you on a happy note, um, we were reunited. Uh, and that's been about 20, 23 years ago. Wow. That's awesome. And I always, I always knew I would find him. I vowed. 
I would always find him. In fact, talking about vows, I made a commitment to God that if he took my son and gave him the opportunity to be placed in a home where he could have a mother and a father, I promised that I would do the same for somebody else's child that needed a home. Aww. And that's wow. why my two children, after my first son, were adopted. Wow. Because I chose them. They are my chosen children. Just like the family chose him to give him a home. So I was really blessed. And I just wanted to pay that forward. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, gosh, you could probably speak just a topic of, of adoption, pro-adoption, right? And <laughs> Yeah. Look for. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so in your, so did anything else happen? I mean, once you left the home at 16, did the abuse stop? No, honestly, did you, no. Did you find it in other places? Did, did other people abuse you or was it? Cause I know your father, your, um, stepfather did, but that, I guess, ended when you left? What? How did that play out? Um, I, unfortunately, because I had, everything was unprocessed, I was told never to talk about it, never to uh, think about it. And so I was, I was hushed. I was, I was invalidated. I, I, I don't know what else to say other than I had to keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep on going. And that's what I yeah. did. Coming home when I was a child was like walking into a war zone because I didn't know what I was walking into every time I came home from school. So walking in, I didn't know if my mom would explode or if there would be a landmine around the corner with a belt or whether, you know, my stepdad was going to show up and harm me. Um, there was always something going on always something going on. So I kind of trained myself, I think, to kind of gauge the house and the energy in the room and kind of get a feel for what was going on as I walked in so that I knew what to expect. And I, you know, had like this little routine I would do. And I lived in my room. I mean, that was my safest place. My safest haven was just to stay in my room. And that's what I did most of the time. So I kind of saw and, and visualized my childhood as being in the army, I guess, in the sense that I was in a war zone. I was a soldier and I had to make sure I did whatever I could to protect myself. And my troop was my brother. And I really looked out for him as best that I could, even though there was really nothing much I could do. So, so am I understanding correctly that you had, after you gave up your child for adoption, you were able to actually go back home and live? Is that what happened? Where, where did you go after that? No, um, I was in my car for a little bit. I talked to my aunt and I asked her to speak to the grandparents and with a lot of reservation, they al allowed me to go stay with them. It was the beginning of November, I remember, because it was getting pretty cold sometimes in Florida and it was just too cold to sleep in the car. Yeah. So they agreed to let me go to their place and I was unwelcome uh, the whole time. And I remember my aunt calling me one time going, hey, you know, your grandparents are really, you know, doing a lot for you and yada, 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 and really need you to chip in for food and stuff. And I'm like, time out. Um, I don't eat breakfast. Uh, I damn sure don't touch their, you know, lunch meat for lunch and whatever. I, I went hungry is what I did. And the only time I ate their food is when, you know, they came home for dinner and my grandmother would cook. And she would put a bowl in front of me and I would eat all of that. And I never asked for seconds because again, I felt very, very uncomfortable. I wasn't wanted there. And my aunt, I was getting $60 a week. I'll never forget it. 60 lousy dollars a week from unemployment because I had worked and I was let go for whatever reason. So that little lousy $60, my aunt said, well, can't you at least give them $30 a week? And I said, that's half, half of the money that I get from unemployment. And 
my freaking tank takes 20, 30 bucks of gas. So that would leave me absolutely nothing. And so I told her flat out, no, no, I cannot help my grandparents with $30 and I don't eat their food. Cause she at the time was saying, well, you know, you, you do use their water and you're taking baths and you're doing this and you're eating their food. And I'm like, no, once I got up in the morning, I was out that door. I was out the door looking for work because I didn't want to stay with them as much as they wanted me to stay with them. I didn't want to stay there. So it took me about six, seven weeks. I was gone. Wow. And that's fast. Yeah. Well, when there's a will, there's a way. I mean, I made up my mind. I didn't want to be there. And I busted my butt to try to find a location that I could go and literally support myself. And I did. And shortly thereafter, I got married at 18. I wanted to belong. I wanted to be part of a family so badly that I married a man and he was abusive, just like the beatings I used to get, except this time, I'm not sure what happened inside of me, but I do remember after a couple of beatings, I one day just had enough. And this man stood six foot three, I believe it was, six three, six four, and he punched a door and he said, you make me so mad I could punch you. And I got up, I walked over to him, I pointed way up in the air and I said, you lay one more finger on me. Make sure I never get up because if I have one ounce of strength left in me, I will kill you. And his eyes got really big. He looked like he just got disheveled and he was like, I, I, I wasn't going to do that. And then I walked away and thought, Maria, what the hell did you just do? <laughs> get out of the house now. Poof. I was gone. I left. I left for the yeah, I mean, you were basically showing you're you were rising up and showing that you did have the power within to just say stop. You know, you're p proposing it on him, but it was like a lifetime of yeah. of putting up with stuff, right? That you just exactly. had enough. He he just was at the brunt of it, right? Oh, um, yeah. yeah, and so well, let's see, how old were you? What were you like? Twenty years old when you left him? Uh, nineteen. Okay. 19. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do? I know, I know you had a successful career. So what did, when did you, everything start, when did everything start turning around? Let's start bringing the conversation. I mean, cause I think we've covered like the abuse and the unhealthy yeah, relationships and the feelings and everything. Mm -hmm. When did everything start turning around for you in your um, life? When I went full-time with Lockheed, I, felt a significant shift. And I felt also that I am somebody, you know, I might not be somebody's idea of, oh, you know, you are valued in my eyes. It, that wasn't about it anymore for me. It was more like, this is how I feel about me. And it doesn't matter what other people feel, say, think, or do. The bottom line, and I told you my little mantra earlier, if it's to be, it's up to me. So in order for something to happen, I knew I had to make that happen for me. Nobody was going to give me a nickel. In fact, the time I landed out in the street, nobody gave me a nickel. Nobody even gave me, like I said, a half of a sandwich, nothing, nothing at all. So I, I, I knew better than to ask anybody for anything because it wasn't going to come my way ever. I'm going to come my way. So I just knew that I had to pick myself up from my bootstraps. I had to move forward. Mark was okay. I knew he got adopted because I checked with the agency all the time. And he was adopted within like four weeks of, of him being placed or something like that. So now that I knew that he was okay, it, it wasn't that, you know, I wasn't broken. It was the fact that in my mind, I knew I would find him again one day. And I wanted him to be so proud of me. Him looking at me. I'm sorry. <laughs> And um, being proud from where I came from. You know, I, I come from a line of illiterate people in my family. I come from a line of just so much dysfunction, uh, so much abuse, so much stupidity. Uh, I, I didn't want any part of it, and nor did I want him to ever experience any of that. So I knew that one day when I got to see him, I wanted to make sure I had all my shit put together and that 
was one of the catalysts that drove me to get my GED. And then I heard I could go to college, but I didn't know that until I got to Lockheed and they mentioned the word college to me. And I'm like, I can even go. And they're like, oh yeah. I didn't know that. I never heard the word college in my family ever, ever. All I heard was get a job, go to work, get a job, go to work. Yeah. And my first job was at 11 years old. And I worked 35 hours a week for this family that had three little children under the age of four that I took care of after school every day. Wow. That's interesting. (laughs) It's interesting that at that age, you had that experience because you just a few years later, you were having your own child. Right. But that's our culture. You know, you cook, you clean, you wash, and you take care of the kids. So if there's little ones around, you look out after the little ones. I mean, it's just how we were raised. That's what we did. So things started looking up for you when you went to Lockheed. And then you had a successful career. You had your own company, right? But I do attribute that, honestly. The second man I married, he was like a diamond. Um, It's like, oh, my God, I struck gold here. And he believed in me, never doubted me. And he said, why don't you start your own company? And I'm like, for my own company, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, yeah, you know, just go figure it out, whatever. And it was because of him that I stepped out on my own. And, you know, the rest is history. I, I helped one person and my background was in marketing when I got my degree and I loved it. So I just wanted to keep myself busy and I chose to help out. And the next thing I know, I got referred here. I got referred there. And before you know it, I'm running a company. And I wound up with like 24 people working underneath wow. me. For my wow. own business. Mm-hmm. That is success. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. So let's, in you know, we're, we're going on 46 minutes. So let's bring the conversation into the helping the hearts heal part of the conversation because there are hurting hearts out there and they Everyone. now they're Everywhere. Yeah. And now that they know you had a very long life of hurting, mm-hmm. they know you've been down that path and that road, but how have you brought yourself up out of those ashes? And what, what are the beliefs and the concepts that you live from today and that you talk about in the book? Uh, the biggest thing I will tell you is I know my worth. I know my inherent value and no one can take that from me unless I give them permission to do so, which I flat refuse to. Right. And it doesn't, and I don't, I don't look externally for my validation, my worth, my integrity, or my views. I am very happy where I am today. I know what I've been through. And I know there's a lot of people out there walking wounded still. And my goal is to just plant a seed. If I don't ever get to see someone again, I want to plant a seed of either hope or a smile or show them some light because we are not always here to see something grow to fruition. We have to be able to kind of, see someone and and maybe offer a smile. I mean, that one smile that they got today might've been something between literally life and death. They might've been thinking of suicide. They might've been thinking of, I don't know, uh, you know, doing something terrible. And that one smile made them feel that somebody cared. And as I shared with you earlier, you know, I, I truly feel that everyone in this world, including me, was walking around with this invisible sign going, hey, hey, um, make me feel important. Make me feel valuable. Make me feel worthy. Do you see my value? Do you see my worth? What can I do to fit in? And it's never about fitting in, I've learned. It's never about fitting in. So I will not contort myself or shrink myself to be somebody's ideology of what they think I should be. This is me. This is who I am. Like it or walk. I don't care because that's how confident I am in myself. And until we stop and think about the choices we make 
and why we're making those choices. That's to me the most critical. And so that was a lot of self-awareness I had to stop and think about and go, whoa, 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 whoa. Why do you feel I need their whatever permission or their acceptance or their love? I mean, yeah, they might be family or yeah, that was my best friend or whatever, but the bottom line boils down to me. Am I happy when I'm home alone and I look in that mirror at the end of the day? And my answer is yes, because my belief in my commitment with my God is like this. No one can pull it apart. It's not loose. It's not like this, like, oh, okay, we can pull. No, it's, it's intertwined like this. <laughs> but all I have to do every single day, Lydia, is answer to one person. And Trust me, if I did not do something well, which I have, okay, I don't walk on water. And I have said to him, boy, um, yeah, I, I screwed that shit up today, didn't I? You're right. I was angry. And then I identify why. Why was it that I lost my shit? And if I can pinpoint it, which 99.9 I do, I stop and I think about it. And then I think about how I could have handled that differently. Bottom line. I mean, yeah choices. Every single choice we make will lead us closer or further away from where we want to go. I tell everybody that. So we are responsible for our future, for our destiny, for where we're going. And we don't have to owe anybody anything. And it was a hard thing because I wanted to be loved and appreciated and wanted in my family. But there came a point in a time where it's like, you know what, I, I'm not going to bend myself like a pretzel so that you're comfortable with me. Cause guess what? I'm not comfortable being bent like a pretzel. Yeah. It's basically putting yourself first. And one of the things that I've learned through my life is that my happiness is my responsibility. And if I put my happiness in something outside of myself, in a person, in a relationship, in a religion, in a family member, in anything, it's external to me and I can't be in the driver's seat of that. So right. keeping your, um, the, what, like what, one of the things that Oprah always says is that we just want to matter. We want to matter to ourselves and we want to matter to other people. But what we'll find in life is that our happiness will lie in mattering mostly to yourself because you get to right. choose with every decision whether something is going to make you happy or not. And I personally right. believe that we are powerful creators of our lives. And so the mm -hmm. more we believe in something and the more we put our thoughts onto something, we can create and manifest that in our lives. And right. so we are powerful beyond measure. And until we really get that inside and know that, we'll be, keep searching for things outside of us That's, to make yeah. us happy. And it's not there. It's here inside. Bottom yeah. line. That's where it lives. Yeah. And we're all, we are all energy. And going on what you had just said, my little motto was and has always been what you think about you bring about. So whatever thoughts you put out there, the negative ones, I, I never speak negative of myself. Every blue purple moon, I might catch myself say something and I immediately nip it and go, whoop, no, no, let's back that up. Er, we're going to totally cancel that out. And, and then I replace it with two or three positive things because it just, it's not going to fly, not in my universe. And I also tell people, and I, I shared this with you as well, about if there's negative energy in the room, and I feel it, I'm not staying. I will no longer be in a space where it's uncomfortable. So if I can check somebody, I'll check them and say, hey, just want to let you know, mm, that is not a good idea. I feel your energy. Take that crap right out back from that door because you're in charge of your energy and I'm in charge of mine. And I'm putting down a boundary right here. You cannot cross that line with me. And I, when I wrote this book, I want to be the voice of the voiceless. 
I want to empower other women to rise and men. I mean, I, the majority of, of guys, I think it was roughly 20% have experienced some type of trauma in their life. But as far as the sexual abuse side, it's more like 60 to 70% for women. And granted, they're like, well, those aren't the statistics we have out there. Uh, I'm going to call bullshit on that. What the reason is because it's not been reported. Okay. Right. It's like a shame about, based abuse. Thank you. Yeah. Exactly. You got to pull that shame out of it. Yes, exactly right, right. Right, because you there's a perception that something's wrong with you if you have been victimized. Yes. So no yes. one's willing to, and they don't feel validated even when they share it. They open themselves up to vulnerability, and and yet it's not satisfying. And they get, exactly, and and they get invalidated, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Cool. Well, um, is there anything before we wrap up that you want to, that I didn't ask you that you want to mention or need to mention if people want to get in touch with you or buy your book, like how do they find you? Oh, um, I do have a uh, website. It's called soulonfire.org. And they can go there if they would like to just learn a little bit more about who I am. And I also have soft cover and hard cover on Amazon directly. Wrapping up, I just want to leave a two little liner. And that would be our view of the world truly depends on how we see ourselves. Okay. So we are either a victim or we're the victor. And that choice is up to us. So people who complain and oh, this and oh, oh, and oh, oh, it's because of how they view that. If they stop and go, you know what? I'm in control of those emotions. I'm in charge of how I feel. Like all those things that happen to me do not define who I am. I get to choose that. I get to choose my story. It's all on me. And I choose to make this world a better place, not only for myself, but for others. And I'll do anything I can to help and do it. Absolutely. Lydia, is, I thank you. Yes, which is which is beautiful, which is why we had you on the Oneness Junkie podcast, because this podcast was created to highlight individuals like you, Maria, who are using their time and their talents to help raise the vibration of the planet and make the world a better place. And with your book and your story and getting out there, and I know that you want to get out there and you want to yeah. tell your story and mm -hmm. eventually you want to be speaking. So if anybody yes. is interested in this topic from a speaking perspective, um, feel free to reach out to Maria at her website, soulonfire.org and get in touch with her. So I just thank you for taking the time to tell your story today. I hope, I hope that we have done what we intended to do, which <laughs> was to open up a conversation so that some hurting hearts could heal and find a pathway outside of being stuck in their pain. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. yeah. One step at a time. That's what I say. Just one one step at a time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being My here. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We've reached the end of this episode. If you'd like to continue with this inspirational journey, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out. If you're a self-proclaimed oneness junkie, get yourself a t-shirt and spread the message of oneness in your community. And finally, if you have a story to share or know someone that should be a guest on this podcast, contact us at onenessjunkie.com. See you next time. And remember, when we heal ourselves, we heal the world. Compassion starts with you and me.